much into mother's... No! No, it should be my. My. A day doesn't pass without us remembering the joy he brought to the certain household and his valour, bravery and, uh, yes, dedication to King and Friday, 21st of June, 1918. Dear Mrs. Wills, I trust this letter finds you in good health. Thank you for your kind words last year. A heavy burden has hung over the household since George was taken from us four years ago. And it is only now, with brighter news from the front, that God rewards me with the strength to write back to you. On Sunday, 28th of July, 1918, the families of Weybridge's Fallen will gather in St. James's Church for the annual Grand Memorial Service. I know George would want you to be there and to see his name in gold leaf upon the parish's roll of honour. And... anymore. Oh, if it's Mrs. Johnson from the Smokes for Soldiers Fund, tell her I'll happily donate her father. Oh my. You. M Mother, this is Mrs. Wills. Mrs. I don't know who Mrs. Wills is. So wonderful to see you, man. Thank you so much. Mother. I beg your pardon. I was just telling your charming daughter here how thrilled I was to be invited to the memorial service with you. My goodness, woman. Whatever gave you that notion? Mother, You're not joining us in the service. Ma Mother, I, I... But you invited me! Here! I did no such. Come to our house an hour before. Sign Mrs Thomas Surtey. You! <laughs> Impossible. Mother, I did it. I invited Mrs Wills. What? Miss Surtey? George 
wanted her to be there. And with the Americans joining the war, I thought it might be your last chance to join us. And I knew you wouldn't do it, so I did. Mrs. Wills, I can only apologise on behalf of my daughter. She's clearly ill. A fever of the mind. Fetch my purse, Margaret. Then you must rest ahead of today's service. Mrs. Wills, I insist on reimbursing you the cost of your wasted journey. Well, I'll be in now. And, of course, a little extra for goodwill and your discretion. My purse, Margaret. <coughs> Mother, I implore you, I am quite well. Please don't send Mrs. Wills away. George wanted her to be there, and she must. Keep your money. I ain't come here just to go go home again before I've been to the memorial service with you. I've too many regrets. I ain't having another. There's me thinking you are a Christian woman, Mrs. Surtey. I am. Then don't rob me of my chance of joining you and them other mothers. <laughs> other mothers? Mrs. Wills, with the greatest of respect, you surrendered the right to call yourself a mother when you gave George to me. <coughs> I fed him, clothed him, mocked his brow, set him on the path of righteousness, and I gave him a future. Where is you? Only ever gave him a way. You are my baby! He was my son! You say you want to remember George, but you never knew him. Stop, please. You know I couldn't do that. You know it weren't possible. But I did mean I didn't stop thinking about him. I prayed for him every night, asking God to keep him safe so that one day we might meet again. That's so very touching. Touching? It were foolish. My son's body's been resting amongst the fishes at the bottom of the North Sea since the beginning of the war. Seems the whole of Surrey knew HMS Ork had been torpedoed, except me. But I just kept on doing what I'd always done, praying for the health of the dead man. No, you mustn't say that. Psalm 94. The Lord is a God who avenges. Don't I know it. And this, the way you'll treat me now, is further punishment for my wrongdoings. It's all terribly true. You're wrong, Mrs. Wills. God gave me the courage to write to you. God brought you here today to be closer to George. He knew my mother couldn't do it. We, George and I, we talked so much about you. You did? It crossed my heart. If there had been a way, he would have tracked you down himself. But I know he wanted you to see the role of honour and to be proud of the life that you brought into this world. Margaret! I can't imagine what you went through to bring George into the world back then, especially knowing you'd never be allowed to keep him. Enough! You acted with honour and integrity. Many women in your position would not have done. And then you gave George to mother and father, and you gave me the best brother anyone could have, so thank you. God wouldn't punish you for that. Oh, thank you, Miss. Margaret Francis Surti. Reverend Buller is permitted to interpret the Lord's actions. You are not. You do it. It's God's will. That's your answer to everything. That's not the same. I'm urging. In church, when Sid and Fred asked why the list of the fallen seemed to grow each week, or why their friend coughed one day and died the next, or why we are still at war with Germany, even though God is supposed to be on our side, or why George... When George didn't come home to us like he promised he would, you just say the same thing. It's God's will. God's will. <laughs> Look how you have upset my daughter by coming here. My offer stands. Go now without any more fuss. Mrs. Surtey, you lost George once. I lost him twice. Your letter, Margaret's letter, will it's fired me up. So let me be clear. I'm not going until I've done what I've been invited here to do. I want to experience what you've had the privilege of feeling all these years. So, I'm going to stand with the other mothers. In our grief, <coughs> we're going to sing and get
give praise to the Lord for our sons. You would do that to me? In my church, after everything that I have done for you? Look at me skin, and me hands. War's done this. Yours are as soft as the day they first held George. Fans the same too. But change is coming, Mrs. Certainly, mark my words. Working folk like us, we've woken up. We've seen that we're just as important to winning this war as people with big houses and fancy clothes. The shells I make are more powerful than you can imagine. We're born fighters, us Wilses. George was a fighter, you can see it in his eyes. So, the question is, do we go together? The prospect of being seen with you in my church is... The vicar doesn't know you. If anyone asks, I'll proudly tell them. I'm Florence A. the Wills. Then I'll take them by the hand and I'll lead them to the roll of honour and I'll say, look up there. That's my boy, that is, first class stoker, George Wills. Wills, mind you, not certain, then they'll definitely know who I am. Get out of my home. Devoted to them, but 
some quiet prayer at home will help nourish your soul. Good day to you. I can't go there, it's the dog who makes their cough worse. Reverend, I've examined the roll of honor. With a steady hand, his name would fit below Woodward. Private Frank, now Royal West Kent Regiment. That's all I'm asking. Mrs. Knapp, I appreciate your losses were greater than most, but we cannot just add another name. Please, for that voice. There's a cost. It would be unfair. I'm sorry for your losses. So often it is the women folk who bear the greatest burden of war. It is their tenderness and care that we rely on to uh, prepare our knights for battle. Knights, yes. Uh, and yet, it is our women who must live with the consequences. But I'm afraid adding another name at this time is uh, quite out of the question. So please, let this matter rest, and we can both be on our way. You have to! I assure you, I do not. Well, couldn't you at least mention in that service, Frank Albert Knapp, Royal West Kent Regiment? Mrs. Knapp, the Roll of Honor and today's memorial service are for the honorable men of this town, the brave killed in the war. And my husband was killed in the sun. But he was a conscript, Mrs. Knapp. Who died at the hands of the Hun, just like many of the men on your roll of honor. Mr. Knapp only joined the colors when the law compelled him to. He, he died fighting for his king and country. He had no choice. I have tried to be kind to you. I really have. The fact is, your husband was a malingerer. No! He shirked his duty and ignored God's call to arms. That's not true! Your husband enjoyed the fripperies of home life for two years, <clears throat> while his Christian brothers, who freely lay down their lives, were slaughtered and maimed. Stanley Adams, <coughs> fine young fellow, married too, <laughs> sang in my choir every Sunday without fail. The moment he heard the Germans weren't playing fair, he went into khaki, killed last September. Now that's the sort of plucky chap people want to remember. You can't pick and choose who to remember. Your objection is noted. Eddie. Oh, begging you pardon, sir. Do forgive my sister. She's had a ghastly time of late. Yes, yes, of, of course, of course. My condolences to you and your family. I strongly suggest you escort your sister home. Perhaps help her find some comfort in the Bible. Good day to you. Thank you, of course. I won't let you forget it! Hey, he's very busy. Today of all days. Now, please come along. You heard what he said. Besides, we need to talk. Frank didn't deserve to be remembered because he was a conscript. That's what he said. I'm sure he didn't. Well, if he did then, that's, I'm sure that's not what he meant. If Frank's not on the memorial, there's no record of him. It's, it's like he never existed, like none of us ever existed. Frank and the boys are in heaven. And you spend so much attention to their graves and at the memorial. They wouldn't want you to be like this. Now come along. I see him, Grace. He's disappointed in me. Don't let me be forgotten. The last words he wrote to me. He knew this would happen. Right. <coughs> it was amongst his papers they returned. 
after today's service, they will all know who Private Frank Knapp was. I won't allow them to forget what he did. What? Oh, please calm down. I know what you're going through. I do. Months passed before I accepted that Mr. Fremantle wasn't coming home. But Annie, grieving is something best done in private with dignity and decorum. I found Paul's letters to the Corinthians particularly comforting. Oh, you'll get into serious trouble. And I told you we would find her in the churchyard, but you said no. Let's split up. We'll find her quicker. My feet ache. I walked the entire length of Weybridge, spoken to 100 people or so, and now I think I've got a blister. And it's all thanks to you. It's a placard. She's being impossible. Did you put her up to this? Did Grace tell you the good news? Alice, no. I found work for you. Uh, we found work. Work? Mrs. Brooks agreed to take you on. It's a large house, Balfour Road. What? Why? Oh, Auntie dear. Three meals a day, guaranteed warmth. It's something you can only dream about in your damp little cottage. No, what ever possessed you? I prayed and the Lord delivered. It's a splendid opportunity. <coughs> you think I can just turn my back on who I am? A mother and a wife? I devote my life to servicing someone else's family? I can't. I... I won't. Well then, you end up in the workhouse. Is that what you want? I... I want my family. I want my life back. Remember Frank now. Give it back. Annie, this is your life. No! You know why I need to do this, don't you? All along, they promised our men honour and glory for joining the fight. Even the rector described them as knights. But there must be thousands of men, just like my Frank, who denied the honour and glory they deserve. They want to forget them. They want to write them out of history. That's awful. But, Grace is right, Annie. I think you know that. You take that in there and gossip's going to spread like wildfire. Your reputation will be tarnished. But take Grace's advice, accept Mrs. Brooks' offer. You can rebuild your life again. Make Frank and the boys proud of you. Who knows what this job might bring? One day, we might even be able to vote. The men are finally learning that they have to listen to us. The rector certainly heard you. With us. Something visible, solid, permanent. How can I fulfill <coughs> Frank's final request? Through your survival, in your future. You are the greatest memorial to Frank and the boys. Your stories, the ones you tell, the ones retold, no one can ever erase those. Really? Yes. In a century from now, people are going to look at that placard and just see a long list of, well, faceless names. Men who lived and died many years ago. But stories last. But mark my words, a hundred years from now, people will know and they will never forget the story of Walter, Frank, Albert and Alice Knapp. For once, our younger sister speaks sense. It's your choice. Yummy, I'm 
in the Navy need attention. The Arsenal kids can help me, you'll admit. But I have a perfect dream of a new recruiting scheme which I think is absolutely it. If only other girls would do as I do, I believe if we could manage it alone. But I turn all suitors from me but the sailor and the Tommy. I've an army and a navy of my own. On Sunday, I walk out with them. Now move. We fought to get the vote for women like you. 
for me. I have a house to look after, meals to prepare and socks to knit. Only men have time to play politics. What is Tommy going to say when he returns home a hero, only to find his job at the factory is being done by a woman? Woe betide her if she lectures him about equality. When the men return home, they'll remember what you did. If the law let me shoulder a rifle, I would. But it doesn't. So I support the war by giving Britannia the men she needs. And that's how you justify exploiting the insecurities of young men. He was 21. Who, him? No, my son. Oh. Last Easter, he left his important duties at Whitehall to become a man, an airman. An airman? My boy crashed in France. His bones shattered and skin burnt. He lay in agony for four days until he finally passed away. If it hadn't been for someone like you, he would, he would have stayed at the Admiralty. My boy would still be alive. You and your friends have no idea of the damage you do. Calling my son a coward. You ignorant suffragettes. You've caused Mr. Willis and I so much pain. Willis? <coughs> Do you know him? Mr. Willis! Oh my George! Get off me! Come quick! Oh. Get off! Go. What the devil? Mr. Willis, George, you must get to the bottom of this. I think she knows something. I think she knows something about Howard. You! You've met before? I will handle this, Mary Jane. Both on the Hopkins. Keep them talking. We cannot afford to lose that contract. Well, go on. You. Ah. You. You were outside the tribunal. <coughs> yes, it was you, wasn't it? I was granted those exemptions, fair and square. Then you humiliated me on the steps in front of everyone. There is nothing fair and square about depriving the army of fit recruits. <gasps> First, you harangue my workers and humiliate me. Now, I find you harassing my wife as a remembrance service. A service that we're only attending because the suffragettes shamed my son into doing something that cost him his life. The order of the white feather wasn't meant for him. I'll see you stand trial it for slander. It was meant for you. <laughs> me? Madam, I am too old and exempt from military service. But not too old to crawl to the tribunals because you feared losing your workers and wealth. That was cowardly. I have given three sons to this war. And both my sisters were widowed. And Annie's two sons, six and three, died because they had no father to care for them. If everyone had given as much to this war as she did, it would be over by now. Ah, piffle. We, the members of the Women's Political Political Union wanted you to have the white feather to show that whilst the men who make laws may exempt the businessmen, capitalists and churchmen, the women's daughters and widows of Alton and Ainbridge do not. Good grief, women! <coughs> you talk as though I deprived the army of a battalion. It was three men and only six month exemptions. Four men. Four? You forgot Howard. Now you leave him. He wanted to join the fight. You know nothing of my son. They won't let me join. That's what he said the morning when he picked up the feather that was meant for you. So it was you? Me. Why, God help me, if you were a man, I would. Come on. Oh, no. No. There's been enough suffering. Have you any idea of what you have done? I had everything under control, and if you had just kept... Yeah. I built my business from nothing. My appeals to the tribunal, and the reason we wanted Howard to remain in London. It wasn't just about wealth. Willis and Sons. That was all I ever wanted. Selfish? Maybe. But, madam, I am not a coward. I have heard enough. I believe this is yours.
mother. I do wish you would reconsider and, and join me at the service. Are you absolutely sure about this? Quite sure, Doris, dear. Send him in. And mother will see you now. I came as soon as I read your note. Are you well? Quite well, thank you. <coughs> um, a drink, Reverend? The rector won't stay long. He must tend to his flock and he has the memorial service. I can always make time for you, Mrs. Brown. Water, please, Miss Brown. May I? Everything was in my letter. You wrote only that you felt you could not attend this afternoon's service, and that I should not expect to see you in church for some time. It is for the best. I thought perhaps you had contracted that dreadful influenza. I came as quickly as I could, and I would have been here sooner, <coughs> but for an encounter with a most troubled woman. Now I am here, I see you are both in good health. And I am even more perplexed. Thank you for your concern, but it really isn't necessary. Mrs. Brown, today's memorial service is a momentous occasion for the spiritual welfare of this parish. I appreciate it. It is your first time attending <coughs> as a mother of a fallen soldier. I fully understand. It is both arduous and a burden. But you have maintained such dignity throughout your grief. You are an exemplar to the town's womenfolk. And I simply urge you to attend. I'm afraid, Raymond Buller, the church no longer affords me any comfort. Uh, Mrs. Brown. Where is that girl with your water? The church is your family. Through my work, with your husband, God bless him, and you by his side, we have been the bedrock of this parish. And it is in these darkest of times we are needed most. And just as our Lord and Saviour did, as he was led to Calvary, and your Harold too, as he strode onto the battlefield, you must have courage. Your Richard is twelve this year. It's thirteen. Thirteen? Oh my. And you no doubt wish to see your daughters married with children of their own. Yes, yes, of course. And you too, for your Evelyn and young Doris here. Oh, that would be delightful. Oh. Oh, Doris! Excuse me, please. I'll clean this up. I'm sorry um, But what kind of life will we have when this bloodshed continues? It's been four long, miserable years. I want peace. And you will have it. For the Lord will deliver the righteous. And he will guide us to defeat the evil German Empire. German is not evil. How can you say that? It is a Christian country. We praise the same God. Yes, <coughs> but this war is man's will, not God's. The Lord has seen the Huns' atrocities, <laughs> and he has ceased to answer their prayers. That is one opinion. That, madam, is the position of the Church of England. But the Gospels teach us that it is a sin to kill, and that we should forgive those who trespass against us. Surely it's the act of war that is the true evil. I see. My boy laid down his life, and hundreds of men from this town. I taught many of them. And now they rest in shallow graves, spanning from France to India. They will 
would have their reward in heaven. I simply cannot attend your service. <coughs> I fear that we've, had, we've all caught up, become so caught up in a rhetorical war. I fear people have forgotten why we fought. <coughs> and I fear I can stay silent no longer. Really? And worst of all, I cannot justify my son's death. He died defending home and hearth from the Kaiser's tyranny. But did he? Hmm. The newspapers will have you believe that. You, a man of faith, preach that. But sir, I'm a scholar and a woman of fact. Oh, right. The ancient Greek philosopher Herodotus wrote, no one is bold enough to choose war instead of peace. Yet, this government took us into war with Germany, a war that neither side could win. Mrs. Dow, oh, think carefully. That's seditious talk. You call Germany a tyrant. It has the most progressive electoral system in Europe. Mrs. Brown, think of the Belgians and the passengers aboard the Lusitania. Oh, think of your fellow Britons who live in fear of oh, those Gotha aircraft. The Germans are an ungodly people. There are atrocities on both sides. Oh We've discussed these stories. Since Edgar's death, I have ruminated. Harold did not have to die. This was not his war, just as it is neither yours, nor mine, nor Doris's. This is a war of emperors and bankers and industrialists fighting for the earth's riches. If Mr. Brown could hear you now, he would object most vehemently. Oh, I'm, I'm certain of that. Alas, Edgar is no longer with us. And I am once again permitted to hold and discuss my own views. And what of you, Miss Brown? Do you share your mother's sympathies for the enemy? Like mother, I want to see these. And quickly. I do support our men, but not this war. Volunteering at Mount Phoenix Hospital, I have attended men with horrendous injuries. The victims of unimaginably destructive technology. This war has become an industry. But. But. But I would like very much for Mother to to put up aside her opposition and, and attend this afternoon service with me. But I respect her choice. Mrs. Brown, Amelia, it saddens me to hear you speak such toxic words. I am duty bound to protect my parishioners' spiritual welfare. I only hope you will come to your senses. Your absence today will be most unsettling. Especially for the women folk. If they had heard you speak, they would be terribly upset. They will ask where you are, of course. What do you suggest I tell them? The truth? Something they have not heard you speak for many years. Take <laughs> that back. In 15 years I've known you, many of your sermons have been spiritually enlightened. Mm -hmm. These days, however, you act more like a representative of the war office than a representative of the law. Mother, your sermons consist of propaganda and vitriol. Yes, Brown. Mother, no, Doris. As the death toll has grown, your compassion has diminished. You preach that we should make sacrifices, yet your whole family sits 
before you're in church. Your rectory has a full stuff. You know nothing of hardship. And nothing, nothing the anguish a parent feels. Waking every day knowing their son could be dead was so dumb. Are you right, sir? Reverend? Lieutenant Francis Boyle, Royal Engineers. He's in France. Who? My eldest son. God willing, he will be 26 next month. His mother, my first wife, died in childbirth, and my father in law raised I. I had no idea, my friend. I never speak of him publicly. But Francis gives me the strength to do whatever is necessary to ensure we are victorious. Hundreds and thousands of men are dead. Many more will be killed and still you seek victory. Yes, I do. I preach that God is on our side. The glory favors the brave. And that we must endure our suffering. Because I know it gives this town hope. What? Oh, without hope. We are defeated. The lives and bravery of your Harold and my Francis are demeaned. And the terrible ordeal of families struggling each day across Walton and Weybridge <laughs> is, is for nothing. Mother, 
George will be at the memorial service. I told him all about Harold. He's been so good. I shall bring him for tea afterwards. Yes, yes, please do. Is there anything I can bring you before I leave? I will be fine. You're right, Mother. This war is wrong and, and I wish Harold was still alive. But we should at least take some comfort that even in these darkest of days, love can still flourish.
gentlemen, our beautiful boy from Gordon School, Andrew. Thank you so much. So just a few thank yous to the entire cast and crew that have put on such a marvellous performance this evening. Quick fix theatre, please.